الخير لكل مشاهدينا مشاهدي واتساب ميديا نتورك مع كل هي في رسالة وقصة لأمرأة ما بس نجحت على الصعيد الشخصي وأنما ساهمت بخدمة المجتمع اللي هي فيه ومع كل الظروف اللي عم بتصير بالعالم وانتشار فيروس الكورونا دايما من هون منضوي شمعة لتنير وتثقف جيل المستقبل ضيفتي اليوم هي أول مسلمة عربية أمريكية تعينت بالمحكمة العليا بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وهي أيضا من ثلاث قضات اللي ساهمت أيضا ببدء محكمة ضد العنف الأسري فخليكن معنا بحوار مع القاضي شارلين ألدفر ومنتمنى من كل مشاهدينا أن يشاركونا بها الحلقة بتعليقاتهم وأسئلتهم شكرا لكم it's always a pleasure to have a guest that understands the importance of assisting victims of domestic violence. Charlene Elder is the first Arab American Muslim woman to be elected to a high court in the United States. She has been a judge for the Wayne County Third Circuit Court for 15 years. In addition to that, she was involved in the initiative to create the Domestic Violence Prevention Court to handle domestic abuse cases. She is a board member member of the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services, as well as Michigan chapter of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. Her achievements through her career have also earned her a position as a member of the Michigan Judges Association, a woman that inspires and a commanding presence that believes in justice. And we'll be right back with Judge Alter. <music> The One, we are business consultants who equip leaders to lead at their highest level while building teams that work together and support their team and the leadership. We deliver customized business solutions that fit your company's needs, including business development and customized process solutions. Contact us today. Thank you. It's always great to have outstanding uh, uh, people on the show, especially women. Uh, I'd like to welcome you, uh, Judge Charlene. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You are uh, the first Muslim Arab uh, American woman uh, to be elected to a high court in the United States. How does that feel? How um, did it feel and how does it feel today? Uh, at the time, honestly, it was uh, very surreal. Uh, um, I was very thankful, very honored, very blessed, um, but I can't take credit for it all by myself. Um, I think that I just was in the right place at the right time, and our community was really growing and strengthening, and you know, there was, I had a lot of um, support from community members, because it's not something that you could do alone. And um, I initially sought the appointment from Governor Granholm, and she gave me the appointment, and since then I've ran in maybe two or three elections, and. Um, it's, it's worked out well, but you know, I, I thank God every day for, for my job, and um, I thank God for giving me the opportunity, and I'm thankful to her for giving me the opportunity because I think it was a very necessary and needed niche in Wayne County because we are so underrepresented. At the time, we were so underrepresented. I mean, looking around now, our community is really growing, and we have a lot more representation on the bench. Well, did you feel like a great responsibility to represent Arab Americans in Wayne County? Yeah, it, it's, it's a scary feeling um, a little bit, but at the same time, you know, and I, I was 
when you get appointed to the bench, you don't get to pick where you want to your seat to be. There was opening in the juvenile division and in the family division, and I was placed in the family division. And it, you know, it was interesting because it was the first time in my life I was actually seeing community members too, and it's a very personal and emotional time for them. So you're being exposed to their very, um, you know, their, their intimate details of their lives, and some people don't like that. Sure. But you know, it, it was different, and, and you know, it is a heavy burden. It still is today because when you when you sit in the domestic relations court, you're deciding custody and parenting time, and you know, you're you're giving people a divorce that, that's finalizing something in their lives. It's a difficult time for people, and you have to understand that, appreciate that. And you also have to try to do what's best and make the right decisions for Absolutely, them. And yeah. When people are angry, they can't always see that you're sure. trying to make the best decisions for yes. them. Yes. And you are uh, the first Muslim to represent us in Wayne County. What took so long, you know, to have a Muslim in a county that, that holds a big population of Muslims? So um, I'm not sure if I was the first Muslim Maybe first a woman? Maybe or? the first female Muslim okay. Arab American. Because I know that um, Judge Adam Shakur was a Muslim mm -hmm. uh, male on the bench, and, and um, he's, he's praised by so many, even till today, he's no longer working as a judge. But um, a as a female, it, it, it is. It's, it's a heavy burden, and, and a lot is expected from you. I don't think, you know, from, from a legal perspective, I have to do my job. That's fine. It doesn't matter if I'm Muslim mm. or not Muslim. But, but did you have it, fear, though? Yeah, yeah, because you don't want to let people down, and you don't want to do a bad job and be known as the Muslim judge that does a horrible job. You know? Yes, <laughs> but to be a first female, I mean, it's kind of like a heavy thing, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. It, it's also an honor, and, um, you know, I, I hope that, you know, my presence opened the door for others to come behind me because I think that rather than view us as different, we are the same, we are... Um, we have the credentials, we have the qualifications, it really doesn't matter if we're Muslim or not. And I think we bring a perspective that's, that people really need to understand um, in Wayne County. Even my colleagues, you know, as much as they know about Muslims and Muslims that come before them, so many things that they didn't know. So yes, just, yeah. So you became a role model somehow. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you about while well, you were one of the three judges that helped initiate uh, the court for domestic violence uh, uh, prevention court. Yeah. So, did you feel the need to do that? Was it was there an absence at, at that time? There was. I mean, I can't take total credit for that by myself because um, at the time, um, two now retired judges um, also took that initiative as well. It was Judge Richard Halloran and Judge Connie Kelly. And we worked together because we saw that there was a need, especially um, if you sit in the family division, you do the personal protection orders. So people who are having issues with domestic violence or neighbor disputes, they're coming in to get protection orders against the other side. And we were seeing so much domestic violence mm -hmm. and people are scared to stand in the courtroom with, with an abuser. And we saw that, that it was really something that we could really benefit from here. And when it was County. necessary. Yeah, so, so we started the solutions, um, Solution Oriented Domestic Violence Court. Mm -hmm. And we did that for several years. Just the three of us were running that docket. And now um, our entire bench, our entire family division bench has been trained in domestic violence. So it's no, no longer just a three so person. So how many people uh, now? Um, all 11 of us are, are trained now in domestic violence. And, and I think it just makes a really big difference because even if you do this day out and you think you understand domestic mm -hmm. violence, until you get the training for domestic violence, you really don't know much about domestic violence. So speaking of domestic violence, you know, Arab American women don't speak or don't discuss it openly, right? Because it's a, like a, a taboo, cultural yeah. taboo. Uh, do, um, you know, victims uh, get help? How do they get how, how can we empower women to uh, stand up for themselves I, I through think, your work? Yeah, I do think it's still somewhat of a taboo. Um, and, you know, a, a lot, we're very, uh, I'm trying to say it nicely, we're kind of tribal people, so everything trickles down to the family, and I think sometimes women still feel they don't want to give a bad name for their family yes. if they say certain things. But there are so many services out there today, from when we started the domestic violence court till now, we have so many different services, including in our community alone, like Access does a phenomenal job, um, Empower, they do, they do a phenomenal job. Lots of groups out there are doing Do they have groups. a hotline and uh, stuff? Um, yes, yeah. there, there's, um, with Access, you can go and you can get services from them for domestic violence. You can uh, seek legal counsel. 
Um, outside of access, there's, there's other services as well that mm -hmm. the court will send people to for free legal services. Um, Lakeshore Legal Aid provides legal services for women of domestic violence. And now even Lakeshore Legal Aid has um, a couple Muslim women working there. So I think that um, it's growing. People are recognizing the need in different communities, just like they would with the Hispanic community or the black community. Mm -hmm. Our community definitely has a need. Um, our women sometimes get abused in different ways. It's not necessarily always physical abuse. Sure. It's a lot of emotional and verbal. Um, yeah, verbal yeah, abuse, verbal exactly. Abuse. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, there is help out there, I mean, for people to seek, for sure. Absolutely. And, and you sit uh, in a family division where you uh, tackle a lot of, uh, you know, talked, we talked about domestic violence, and now you, you tackle divorce and uh, child custody. But I want to tackle with you an important subject, with a, which I think a lot of women or Arab American women are puzzled about, which is the Islamic divorce. I want to ask you why, why men don't grant their wives an Islamic divorce here because they're, they're across country they're having a, a, this you know that's a, th a nationwide issue. nationwide issue yeah there I agree um, so it, you know it's not all Muslims across the board and so it makes it very confusing especially for people on the bench who are not Muslims because they're trying to understand why some Muslims can just say talaq three times and they're divorced <laughs> and other Muslims say no he's holding the key to my divorce I can't get divorced which sure. makes it very confusing um, and really, I think our bench has done a great job. They welcome imams to come and speak to them so that they are brought up to speed on the differences and why certain um, sects of Islam. I, I equate it for them like it's like being Baptist or Protestant. Everybody has a little bit of a different take on the divorce issue. Um, but it is very tough. I don't know why. How does it work, though? How does it work? Yes. Okay, well, I don't know why <laughs> men are choosing to hold on to these women, even though they're going, sometimes they're the ones filing for the American divorce. Yes. And they don't want to give them their um, I always divorce. hear the story like men give the civil divorce, but they don't give, they uh, won't the, give the Islamic, Islamic divorce. divorce. It is really like, uh, th does it make sense? Well, in their mind, they can marry again, and then the women can't marry again. So the women are almost trapped, and they just, I think it's a form it's a, like of domestic a revenge. violence and punishment. Uh, it's yeah. a revenge somehow. I, I they want to hurt punishment. their woman and, somehow. And then if know, you, I yeah, say well, that. and it, religiously <laughs> speaking, if you ask an imam, they'll tell you, well, he's supposed to support his wife and care for his wife, and um, as long as he's paying her support to take care of her and paying for the kids. Well, that's I not just, it. I had somebody contact me yesterday on a case where she's divorced, He's not giving her Islamic divorce, and she's the one who's working, and she's going to pay him child so, support. Uh, it's so where's the support? Yeah, <laughs> I just, you know, it, it's tough. But we are, um, we do take that into account, and a lot of people don't bring that up at divorce time, but it's so beneficial. I can't emphasize enough that if you're going through a divorce, you should bring it up in court, even though we cannot, we have no common law, right. and we cannot, uh, we cannot enforce an Islamic divorce. There might be other things we can tailor because in your of divorce. The, because of the separation of uh, church, yes, state and yeah. church? Yes, okay. separation of church and state. And Michigan doesn't recognize, recognize common law marriages. Mm -hmm. So technically, we wouldn't recognize your Islamic marriage anyways. We do recognize, it gets complicated. Uh, can it be like a contract? Uh, well, or take it as a contract? Uh, you can. I, uh, there's, there, so let me start with this. If you get married <laughs> overseas, if you get married overseas and you're Islamically married, and you record your marriage in any country, Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, okay, a marriage somewhere is a marriage anywhere. So right. we will recognize your marriage. Mm -hmm. But if you get married here in Michigan only Islamically, then you're not gonna be viewed married. Okay, okay, okay. so that's, you might have that's a custody. Good to, that's yeah. good to know, yes. You might, and so many people, surprising to me, because I was born and raised here, I went to Fortson High School, people that I went to school with didn't realize that they still had to get legally married in order to be considered a wife. Oh, wow. Yeah, and wow. so why is it bad if you're not considered a wife? Because some people say, well, big deal. If I'm not a wife, if we have kids, I still get child support. I but still, still. You want to be a wife because if, God forbid, your husband passes, you don't get Social Security. You don't get anything. You get nothing. You're not considered a wife. Technically, you shouldn't even get your health insurance because you're not really a yes. wife. Yes. So many people don't understand that. Wow. Even the men don't understand that sometimes. Sometimes, so, yes. Yes. I don't know. I mean, people do it for different reasons, but that's the first thing about the marriages. The second thing is um, if you're not legally married, so many people come in and they want to share in property or get spousal support when they're getting a divorce, 
But if there's no legal marriage and only Islamic marriage, there's nothing that you can argue. It becomes a civil matter. You can't, even if your name's on the house, you can't say, I'm entitled to half the house. You can fight it out in a different court, but not in divorce court. Yes. There's no yes. place in divorce court. This is court. so important uh, to know, I think, to, for women to know their rights and for men. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, as well. Yeah. And another thing, another, I think, an important uh, issue to tackle, you know, in the process of divorce, uh, men start, you know, uh, <laughs> using this situation and they start hiding their income and the assets and they might put it in somebody else's name or just saying, you know, <laughs> or maybe smuggle that money, take it out of the country and buy something either back home or uh, in any other country yeah. so the wife don't get anything. So what's You're the right. solution for that and how could women, how would women find out about that? So I'm going to put a qualifier at the expense <laughs> of sounding like man haters because this is not. But it, no, we're it just, just wondering. I get it. I know. Just sometimes <laughs> it it seems to be that men do it more often than the women. <laughs> in all fairness, um, and it's not just it's not just our. You're community. not going to be hated. No, I it. know it's not just our community. <laughs> but yes, you're right. In our community, um, we do have a lot of issues with people trying to hide assets, and there's nothing nobody has done before. So everybody thinks they're going to one up the judge or. There's nothing that a judge hasn't seen. You know, if you're, if you're not paying taxes, um, if you're putting the house in your father or your brother's name, if your, your family business is in someone else's name, there's really nothing that a judge hasn't seen. And so... So you know it all. Yeah. And, for, well, and, and, and they're pretty, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know how to say it. They're hip to that. They, they are kind of almost expecting that, unfortunately, sometimes, which kind of bothers me. But when this does happen... Um, I think that women have to be smart enough to recognize that you do have avenues. I mean, if you've been married for 20 years and you can show that this family business has been supporting you and your kids mm -hmm. and, and the cars and the homes you're driving, you make a great argument for, even if it's in someone else's name, your spouse will still be entitled, you will still be entitled as a spouse to something from it. You, you know, maybe I can't order the father to give you anything, but I can order that husband to give you certain things knowing that he's making the money even though he's not showing it. So what are the steps for women to take? Well, the most important thing is to have an attorney. I, okay. And I know that a lot of women can't afford attorneys, but there are so many services out there that can help you get an attorney. Like, uh, um, Lakeshore Legal Aid is one. Mm -hmm. um, I heard Access is now going to have attorneys um, for women. Are There's they like free of charge or maybe they charge Lake less? Shore, Lakeshore uh, is free for women of domestic violence. Okay. Um, we have in the courthouse, we have uh, different services. Uh, we have the William Booth Center will help you file your own paperwork. There's different people you can talk to about the process and it's in and of itself. Really the most important thing is to educate yourself on the process. Don't assume you know everything because once they start assuming that they know what they're doing, there's so many things you're going to miss and get overlooked. And you know, it, it's just important to be knowledgeable and, and get your information from somewhere. Mm. So the most important thing is the, the judges know what's going on. I mean, they've seen it all, right? Yeah. It's not exclusive to our community. It's, 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 it happens everywhere. Okay. But, you know, if, if you have been living a certain lifestyle, you know, and, and especially um, certain professions, like uh, I'll give you an example, people who cut hair. Um, always make the argument that they don't have any money. It, mm. they, they live on their tips if they get any tips. And, uh, but in certain communities, cutting hair is a very, very profitable business. Ours, for instance, yes. the black community, it's a very, I didn't know these things even when I started my job. I know in our community it's profitable because yes. I know what they charge yes. us to do our hair. But I had no idea that the black barber, you know, that that's a very profitable business mm -hmm. if you're good at what you do. Okay. So it's really just the experience of doing it enough and maybe asking your colleagues sometimes, hey, what do you think about this? Because if you see it enough, you start to know, oh, no, you have money, hidden money. Maybe you're not claiming on your taxes, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you have access, and she shouldn't be living in poverty. Yeah, so through your experience, you know, all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you, know, you, all see the it. you see enough of <laughs> yes, it every day. Yes. Yeah, you do. And I want to ask you, uh, due to different sects of Islam, we have the Shias and the Sunnis, does it make it uh, harder in the court uh, for Islamic uh, divorce? Well, I mean, it's mostly the Shia that don't allow the uh, Islamic divorce. That's, it's, Wh why is that? Because with Sunni, I believe that if you go to your imam and you ask for the divorce, if you have a justifiable reason, your imam most likely will divorce you. 
with the Shia, okay. they have a different, um, they have in the deen, they, in the religion, they have a uh, aspect. If the woman doesn't, um, when she contracts to marry, well, let's talk about contract to marry after that. <laughs> when she contracts to marry, if she doesn't get what's called basma, if she doesn't get the right to divorce herself, then she's locked into that marriage until he's ready to divorce her. So speaking of uh, Asma, and I wanted to ask you about this, is it common in the community? I mean, we have to explain what the, for the people that don't know the Asma, that you, you don't need uh, your, your husband's permission yeah. or the imam's permission to divorce so yourself. So again, right? I, I think that it becomes another one of those uh, community things that's almost taboo for women to ask for that. Because by asking, then that might mean uh, like an embarrassment almost. Because what is she saying that she's going to divorce him? And it's just culturally, it's I culturally, think that yes. Yeah. And I think there needs to be education on that. I think that if, if as a community as a whole, the women were educated and the men were educated, then maybe men wouldn't want that for their daughters, and then they be more receptive when they marry, you know what <laughs> okay. I mean? But <laughs> it's a bit uh, yeah. uh, complicated. It, it is I mean, I, I don't know if I should ask you this. I mean, if somebody, like if a woman really wants, if, she, if she's a Shiite and she wants to get divorced and she's not getting the Islamic divorce, can she go can to she Sunni, go to Sunni? Uh, I, I uh, suppose that's her business. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering. I, mean, I, I, guess I guess you're going to get a Shiite man that says, uh, that's not a valid divorce. You're, you're going to get a lot oh, of them, because you right? have to go. Like if you're a Shia, you have to go to Shia. That's uh, what he's going to think. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I yes. guess it's going to depend on your um, your religious beliefs. You know, okay. it's going to be personal to the person. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a, it's interesting. I though. know that it happens a lot, though. It does, huh? It does oh, happen a lot. Okay. I, I know several Shia women that have gone to a Sunni divorce. I know and several of the Shia men. And he divorced, or you yes. know, the Imam yep. divorced them. Divorces okay. them. But okay. I know several of the men who say that they're not recognizing them as divorced. But, the but it don't. is recognizable. I mean, it's legal, right? It's, I mean, well, it's, it's all religious. So it's, you know what I mean? It has nothing to do with uh, legally in the U.S. Yes, yes, so it's, absolutely. It's, 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 yeah. yeah. So it's a valid divorce if you view it as a valid divorce, right? Right, so. yes. <laughs> And I would love to hear from our viewers any questions for Judge uh, Charlene. Please, don't hesitate. Oh. And uh, I want to ask you about Maher uh, Agreement. Uh, I want you to update us on this and, yeah. and explain it there uh, as well. There has been a, a recent, very recent change in the law in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, there, was a case, um, there was a case where the woman asked for her Maher. I believe it was $50,000 written in her marriage contract. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it's a good friend of mine who presided over the case, but then she left on maternity leave, oh, okay. so somebody else filled in for her. Okay. But uh, anyways, the, one of the lawyers on the case argued that it was um, grounded in contract law. She said rather than have the judge look at it as an Islamic marriage, she asked them to look at it as a contract between the parties. Mm -hmm. It's signed by the husband and the wife. It's witnessed by the imam and the fathers. You have two witnesses. Um, all four corners of the page make it look like it is, well, it is, it a, is a legal binding contract. Yes. Yeah. So I've never seen it argued as contract. It's come before me a lot that people want their Islamic dowry, they'll say. They want their... And, and is we it don't, the dowry? Is that what... Uh, it's, it's their mahad. It's a form of dowry, I okay. suppose. But yeah. Yeah, but, but the contract is clear. It says that if, if upon divorce, she's entitled to X amount of money. Hmm. So some people have argued it as a prenuptial agreement. And prenups and postnups are very difficult to um, prevail on in Michigan. They have to be written with such precision that it's very difficult. But this particular lawyer argued it as a contract, which 100% it's a contract, and she actually prevailed. And then this went up to the Court of Appeals. That's awesome. Yes, and the Court of Appeals affirmed that decision, and they said that she's entitled to the... $50,000 outside of whatever she would have been entitled to in her um, American divorce. That's, that's so, great. So yeah. from now on, that's it. That is the it law. It is a contract. Yes, that's we can it, is, say. it is a contract. Okay. Now, it, I, I will say this, that they didn't get into, um, in that marriage contract, it said if he could afford to pay, I believe. As okay. My colleague was telling so, us. Uh, the Court of Appeals didn't look at that. The Court of Appeals also didn't look at whether she filed or he filed for divorce. It's just like he owes her, that's mm -hmm. it. Okay. Exactly, so some people say, well, the woman filed, she's not entitled to her, to her mahar. Um, Even if she files, it has nothing to do with it. The Court of Appeals is not getting into any of the religious aspect. They said, here's a contract, 
It says once she gets divorced, she gets the money. She gets the money. Okay. Wow, that's that's yeah. good. That's a that's good information. All the uh, women today. were very happy. Yes, <laughs> I got a lot of calls from a lot of men who were telling me, "What is this?" <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think before we take a break. Um, uh, we have to uh, remind our female viewers uh, that uh, Judge Alder will volunteer uh, some of her time to mentor one of our female viewers. So if you are interested, uh, email us at hiamentor at gmail.com. And I'd like to announce there is an event, uh, an exciting event coming up for the seventh year in a row, CAAPs, 100 Arab American Women Who Care, will bring together dozens of generous women to pull their money and make a bigger impact to a cause that matters to them. So, the tickets cost $100 per person and are fully tax deductible. And the event location is uh, in Troy. Uh, it's, on, it's, well, it's in Michigan Design Center. And uh, we'll put the link and the address uh, shortly on screen. And that's it. And we'll be back. The One, we are business consultants who equip leaders to lead at their highest level while building teams that work together and support their team and the leadership. We deliver customized business solutions that fit your company's needs, including business development and customized process solutions. Contact us today. Thank you. Welcome back. We hope from all of our viewers that they will join us in the program. And if you have any questions for Judge Alder, please tell us about it. And we'll see. I want to ask you, like you, you said in one of your interviews that uh, the best thing that you've ever done is being a judge. So, so you like being a judge more than uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. more than being, more a, than being a, a lawyer, attorney. or the, yeah. <laughs> um, definitely, probably the best career move of my life. Oh, okay, um, that's yeah, nice. Yeah. I, I'm very thankful to have this position. I love my job. I mean, I don't know many people that go into work and love being there. I really do. Um, when I first got appointed to the family bench, uh, in honesty, I didn't want to be on the family bench. I, I wanted to be a, on a civil docket. Okay. I did all civil work in private practice. So I was a little disappointed, but you know, you'll take what you could get. Sure. A couple years in, I, you know, I realized I, it's based on seniority and you can leave the division and go to a different division. I've had maybe several opportunities now to leave the division and go to a different division. I don't act but on them because not yeah, I, I love where I'm at. I feel like every day is different. Um, you feel like you make an impact for people. Yes. And I also feel like I get a little bit of everything. Um, I get a little bit of criminal because of the domestic violence aspect. I get a little bit of civil with the property issues. I, I get a little bit of everything. So a little so, bit of everything. Yeah, I okay. love it. I love, I love where I'm at. I'm thankful. Maybe the only thing I love more than my job is my family. Of yeah. course, I mean, that's <laughs> different. <laughs> which, which honestly, my family is like so much better now that I have this job and I see families that are out there that are in just horrible shape. Yes. Really makes you appreciate what you sure, have. Sure, absolutely. So. so you were born here in the States? Yeah, I was born and raised Born here. and raised in Dearborn? Yeah. Okay. Born and raised in Dearborn. Okay. Um, so my parents still live uh, over by the mosque on Dix. That's where I was raised okay. over there. And okay. Yeah. So uh, you're a mom, you're a wife, and a mom of four kids, yep. and you're a judge. I want to know how you balance your uh, personal life and your, uh, you know, career uh, uh, life. Uh, good question. <laughs> I don't know. Ask my family if they think I'm balancing. I don't know. No, it's, it's, it takes a lot of work. Um, it's much easier now that my kids are older because everybody has their own personality and they're doing their own thing. 
it was a challenge when they were younger because you want to be part of everything. Um, but the nice thing about the job is uh, sometimes it, you know, you get invited to speaking engagements at the school, so it takes me to the school. Um, just different things that, you know, and, and there is flexibility with the job too. If you're setting your own docket, you're setting your own yes. calendar. I was able to do field trips with my kids, and those are important things to me. Yes, to have you ever felt like, have you ever done something like out of guilt, like felt something good, like I want to do something more, so yeah. you, know, you don't feel yeah. guilty you about it? You always feel guilty. I, th I, think, <laughs> I think that's like a mother's nature. You, you just feel guilty, like leaving in the morning and, you know, trying to get your kids out the door to get to school on time. I mean, I... I guess I'm still doing that sometimes when they're all adults, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you. you but it gets easier, I'm sure. It, do, it does get easy. Yeah. It does get easier. Um, I try to cook dinner every night. For oh, them. nice. Yeah, okay, so almost, that's good. Almost every night, I say I'm taking. Are you a good cook? Off, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> you have to ask them. Uh, <laughs> we have to try your food. <laughs> come over anytime. Come yeah. <laughs> so, do, do you f do you think the idea of balance is a false notion uh, for women? or not? No, I think it can be done. I, honestly, I, I think it's helpful if you have a, uh, a spouse that's also um, committed. You know, my, my husband, um, he really wanted me to get this judgeship. Mm -hmm. I can't more so, my husband's also an attorney, so you okay. think that he'd want the judgeship for himself, but he just really, he, he saw probably something in me before I saw in me, so he was so very... He supported um, you. Yeah, he was very supportive. He, you know, he was always very politically involved. I wasn't, and he <laughs> turned me into being politically involved because he now just you have felt to. <laughs> that this was for me. He really felt it, and honestly, like I'm very thankful to that because sometimes you don't see what's good for you until it lands in your lap. And so I'm very thankful that I am where I am. And so, who inspired you growing up? Wow. Well, well, I don't know. Maybe more than one person, of yeah. course. You know, my, my mother was, uh, my mother married my father when she was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. Neither one finished high school. It's the same story of all immigrants, right? They came here. But my mother was very, very, it was very important to her that we got educated. And I could tell she didn't always understand what we were doing in college, but she didn't care. She'd say, you're going to get a degree, right? But she's what? happy that yeah, you're yeah. in college. And she'd ask me, what are you getting the degree in? And, and I was an English major. <laughs> she'd tell me, great, great, that's great. <laughs> well, what's that going to do for you? <laughs> <laughs> so, but she was very, very, I, I feel like that kind of support, like someone who's constantly telling you, and, and then it, it teaches you to appreciate because you see that they didn't have that mm. and how happy they are to yes. see you get that. So it is so, important, yeah. even though she didn't know much yeah. about it, but it is important to have family support, that's yeah, for sure. Very, yeah, very, very. So what keeps you grounded? Mm, my family. I think my family keeps me grounded. My faith mm -hmm. keeps me grounded, yeah, both. So what are uh, your rules of success to get you to where you are today? Well, I suppose, you know, there, there's no rules. It's just, I think if somebody just, you never give up. You know, you really have to, if you want something, you know, I know that when I was trying to get this judgeship, there were several other people in the community who wanted a judgeship as well. Several of them are judges today. They're great judges. Okay. I mean, men in our community as well. But you can't, as a female or a non-female, don't ever let somebody tell you that it's not your time. Because I heard that a lot. I heard I was young, mm -hmm. maybe it's not my time mm -hmm. yet, and other people have done more time than me. And if I listen to that, and I, and I do, again, I credit my husband for that, because sometimes I would tell him, well, so-and-so has been practicing for 20 years now. And he'd tell me, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The rules say five years, and you can, you know, if you practice for five years, you can get a judgeship. And I mean, I've been practicing longer, but still, you know, you, you feel a little sense of sure. insecurity. Sure. Yeah. But if you do that and you and you don't just take the opportunity and you think you always think you have to wait your turn, then I think then your turn might not ever come. So you have to just try for it, whether it's sense. your turn or not. If it's your time, you'll get it, and if uh, not, it does make sense. Yeah. Uh, in a in a in a good way. Have you ever, have you always been scarfed? No, no, I wasn't. So I actually, tell me uh, the story then. <laughs> so I didn't put on my hijab. Probably I think I think I was maybe. 40, a little over 40 when I covered. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I... What made you do that? Yeah. You know, I had been thinking about it for a long time. I have a lot of funny hijab stories, pre-hijab, like uh, before I got the judgeship. Sometimes I would say I want to do it, and uh, we'd joke. We'd sit at the dining room table. My father-in-law would say, not when you're trying for an appointment. You'll never get it. Like, <laughs> we'd joke, but it's funny how back then we saw ourselves. We really thought that 
there was no room for hijabi on the bench. Even us as Muslims felt there was no room for that. So when I got appointed, um, I wasn't wearing hijab. And so about, you were not at that no. time? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I didn't cover for about three and a half years in. I was uncovered for about three and a half years. And then that Ramadan, about three and a half years into my term, I, um, I, I don't know, I just, I always felt that I wanted to do it. I can't say I always felt that way. When I was younger, I used to say, maybe when I'm 80 or 90. <laughs> That's what I used to say. But somewhere along the way, I think when you have kids, you know, and, and you be just become more faithful in different ways, and everybody connects in a different way. And, Absolutely. You know, and, I, and I, I don't judge people because I was uncovered for so long, and believe me, I used to wear clothes <laughs> like you would not believe. So for me to cover, people probably thought, her? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know the story when you came in with the scarf uh, to the courtroom. Um, so that, that was different. Um, the interesting thing for me was really the uh, response of my colleagues because, mm -hmm. you know, they had known me now for about three, three and a half years. They knew I was the Arab judge. They knew I was the Muslim judge, but they never saw me covered before. Mm -hmm. So my first day coming in, uh, it was difficult for me because the first day I went to work with it, with it on, I took it off before I got to the elevator. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then I went back the next day and I said no. I wanted so you to do were not, this. Uh, yeah, I didn't feel confident enough, okay. and I felt like I was going to have to explain myself. The next day, I ended up coming in covered, and it was interesting because people were afraid to say anything to me, even my colleagues. They didn't say anything? Nothing. And it, over time, people started wishing me a happy holiday all the time. Like, I'd go in the judge's elevator, and they'd be, happy holiday, Charlena. Uh oh like, thank you. <laughs> they knew it was Ramadan. Oh, okay. So I don't know if they thought it was like Ash Wednesday when people come in with the cross ash on their head. I don't know if Maybe they assumed they didn't it was know. Uh, um, did you, so did you find an explanation to that? Well, or? I waited. I said, when somebody asks me, I'll, I'll share it with them. But I was shocked because they've been my colleagues now for three and a half years, sitting on the Wayne County bench, some of them 15 years longer than I had been there. You'd think they'd understand what hijab was, but they didn't. Okay. So finally at a bench meeting, I think somebody asked me, you know, when are you taking that off? When's the holiday over? And I said, it's, it's not a holiday. This is here to stay. This and is me now. <laughs> yeah, and I, said, and I had to explain to them why Muslims cover. And just very interesting to me that my own colleagues really... They didn't know. No, they didn't know. Okay. And even after I had covered, I had a, a colleague, a then colleague, he's no longer there anymore, actually asked a Muslim woman to take off her hijab. Oh. After attending several bench meetings with me and knowing that I'm covered, because that's my faith, okay. I never ask... My, my court officer and I never ask any women to take anything off their head. Okay. You know, some women wear flower in their hair or yeah. those fancy hats. And I'll never ask someone to take something like that off their head. So I was really surprised when he asked her to remove it. And she said it was for religious purposes, and he said no. He didn't care? No. Okay. Very shocking to me. Did she so, take it off? Um, I can't remember all the details of that story, but okay. it was very disappointing. I did yeah. send him an email and told him, very disappointing. You know that I wear hijab. You know why I wear it. Why would you ask someone to take yes, it off? That's, yes, that's not, that's yeah. uncalled for, mm -hmm. for sure. Ridiculous. Yes, uh, back to the courtroom. What would you like to see changed in the courtroom? Um, as far as two things, but go ahead. What do you mean as far as two things? Like, you, you know, as mind? far as the, like lawyers, I mean, um, what would you like to see lawyers do more? And another thing that you were, you were going to talk yeah, about. <laughs> okay. So in our, in our division, lawyers are, are generally very professional, which okay. I'm very, very thankful for. Most of the lawyers are very professional. Um, I do think that our community could use more lawyers in this area. Not many, um, not many members of our community want to do divorce custody, parenting time. So in that particular uh, court, yeah. you're talking about divorce. We have lawyers that do a lot of civil work, a lot of criminal okay. work, but we don't get a lot of the lawyers that want to do domestic work. Okay. It's very important, and I think that if they do decide they want to do it, I wish they would um, spend a little more time learning it well okay. because it shows. When you don't know it, it shows. Okay. So we do have a handful of very good attorneys in the community, but for the most part, we don't get a lot of family law attorneys oh, in, in okay. the community. They choose to do other things. And I wonder why. I don't know. I, I don't know why they choose to do other things. I think maybe sometimes people, people don't like the emotional aspect of it. It's already hard enough to deal with clients. As a lawyer, you have to deal with your clients who want to become your best friend. Um, when you're a family law attorney, I can't imagine all the calls you'll get from people yes. crying, breaking down. It's, yeah. it's a very, very difficult time. It for is them. sensitive uh, as it well, is, I it think, is. yes. I think that, you know, sometimes I'm guilty of in court letting people uh, maybe talk too much. Mm -hmm. I try not to do most of the talking. I try to let them do most of the talking. But I'm also a firm believer that 
everybody should have their day in court. And because it's so emotional, at least on their first couple times, I like to let them get it all out. Mm -hmm. And then from there, okay, we're good. I know your story. I don't need to hear it 20 times. Let's move on. But I think they need that. They need that initial. Yes. Do you ever get affected on a personal level, like from one of the cases that uh, um, you ha you've handled you know, throughout the years? Some, sometimes it can be sad, especially for the sake of the kids. Um, sometimes disappointing. Um, you know, pre-hijab, I will tell you a story that really uh, bothered me was before I put my hijab on, I, you know, I, I, I suppose to some I didn't look Arab or Muslim. I, I have light brown hair and, you know, my parents look, my parents almost blend in with American society, so yes. they, they don't yeah. look real ethnic. Mm. But um, I had an attorney who was representing a black Muslim female and she was covered from head to toe. She was a convert, actually. Her husband didn't convert. They were going through a divorce, and he kept saying, the only thing he put in his pleadings was um, that she should not have the kids because she's a Muslim. Oh. Yeah, it was very troublesome. Oh. And my judicial assistant at the time was also Muslim, and she said, Judge, you're not going to believe what this lawyer wrote. <laughs> very um, distinguished gentleman who's known in the courthouse in his, I don't know if he's still alive. He's probably in his 80s now. Oh, he, he, he was, was an older, older man. Okay. Yeah. But throughout the entire trial, he kept saying, uh, look at her. Look at the way she's dressed. Do you think she can take care of kids? Oh, it was so offensive. And that's just, they don't really teach you in judge school how to deal with the bigot. They don't teach you. <laughs> <laughs> so that it was just such a shock to me. And it got to a point where I said, that's enough. Mr. So-and-so, that's enough. You know, I'm not going to tolerate that in my courtroom. Check that at the door. This has nothing to do. Even her husband was feeling uncomfortable. You could tell he mm. felt uncomfortable with his lawyer. But I guess he didn't care. He, he didn't was just care. saying stuff. Okay. I, I suppose the best feeling for me was, it, it's interesting, but about three to four months later is when I put the hijab on. Oh. It had nothing to do with that case. But he came in on a case. And he saw you with, yes, the, with the hijab. and then they opened court and I walked in. And I saw him grab his glasses and look <laughs> at me. <in> there. <laughs> and after that, he wanted to meet with me and apologize to me. And so talk he to came me to about Muslims. <laughs> yeah. And you never know, is it fake or is it genuine? But whatever, at least he learned to the yeah. Bursano, watch his mouth, right? <laughs> so keep it to yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, you said uh, growing up, you did not see uh, not even like a female lawyer, right? Yeah, I, and I, knew, I knew no female lawyers. I probably knew one male Arab American attorney while I was growing up, mm -hmm. uh, a couple more when I was in undergraduate school. And other than, honestly, during my time when I was getting my degree, there was uh, one other girl who went to Georgetown, Farah Barry. She was mm. the only other person that I knew that, w that was getting a law degree. And, and, and what a difference now. Oh, women, yeah. our, I mean, Arab American women are, they pro prosper. presence everywhere. Uh, and they're successful in every aspect of life. Yeah. I mean, we have, even in politics, Lawyers, in, uh, judges, politics. in public service, yeah. uh, everything. But what do you say, what's your advice uh, today to women who maybe some of them are watching us, that they feel like, I can't do it. They, they can. can't do it. Oh, they can. They can. There's nothing, there's nothing that can stop you. Don't ever feel like you can't. I mean, there's, the sky's the limit. I think that one thing about living in this country that's great is everybody has the same opportunity. It doesn't matter where you're from, what your background is. It doesn't matter if you have an accent, if you don't have an accent. It doesn't matter if you wear hijab or you don't wear hijab. There is nothing, even to see today the number of lawyers in hijab. I would have never expected that. I don't know if as a lawyer I would have Tajabit at the time. I just okay. don't think, I think like I used to think about that a lot and I, I don't see um, people having wanting to hire me back then. But now I don't see it a big issue. I see women owning their own firms and mm -hmm. um, hijab and non-hijab. I see, you know, a lot of Arab women, like you said, in politics, public service. It's great. It's great. So what message would you convey, uh, you know, to women about uh, like pursuing their dreams and wearing hijab. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, your hijab is your personal choice. It's between you and God. So if, if you feel comfortable doing that, my biggest pet peeve is if you wear hijab, don't be judgy. I mean, I spent the majority of my life not wearing, so I will never judge. I'll never push it on my kids. You know, that's something between you and God. And I think if you, if you do wear hijab, you've got to keep that separate from your work and from everything else. That's your own personal decision. I know sometimes people see me. I know that lawyers have sometimes used that as, uh, oh, Judge Elder's not going to like you because 
uh, a woman, her, her profession may be a stripper. Oh. I laugh. It's oh, not for yeah. me to judge your yeah. profession. Yeah. I'm just looking at how much income you make and determining what your support shall be. I don't care what you do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's your business. Um, but yeah, I, if, I, if I could say anything to women and the girls up and coming, there's really nothing you can't do, especially in this day and age. And especially, don't let anything hold you back. I, I, I went to Salina Elementary in the South End, and then I went to Fortson High School. And when I transitioned from Salina to Fortson, back then, they would, um, they never would put the kids, they, they had A-track, B-track, and C-track for mm -hmm. education. They never would put the Salina kids in the higher track because they didn't think we were qualified enough. Mm -hmm. A lot of us were bilingual. Mm -hmm. a, a, lot of, a lot of the kids were just um, not doing well on test scores and stuff. So they never would put you in the harder classes. And I remember growing up, I'm the youngest of four, my brother insisted that I take the harder classes. And I didn't want those classes because none of my girlfriends were, my, my girlfriends were no in one girls' did. gym, okay. and, you know, everything was easy street. But he insisted on that, and honestly, it was a good lesson for me, because even with my kids, it's just push yourself, you know, keep pushing yourself. There's nothing you can't do. I, I tell my kids every day, it's not an option. You have to go to college. I don't care what you want to be. You don't have to be a doctor or But to finish your education. You have to yes, get the education. you have to. It's a great advice from you. I want to thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Uh, we're proud me. of you. Thank you. And keep up your good work. And thank you so much for this thank interview you. again. You're doing a great job here, thank too. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and that's it for here. Thank you, and have a good night.